All right, welcome everyone. We are going to cover chapter 17, which is the endocrine system. So I know you guys might be wondering why the endocrine system is uh, grouped in with the nervous system. And that's because there's a lot of interaction between the nervous system and the endocrine system. They're both um, control systems of the body. And so um, I think it fits very well together. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about just the overview of the endocrine system. What does it do? And then we'll get into hormones and how we control hormone secretion in our body. But we're gonna spend most of the time talking about the actual endocrine organs of the body and which um, hormones they secrete and what they control. And then at the end, we will talk a bit about disorders because there are quite a few very common endocrine disorders in the body and a little bit about development. So when we talk about the endocrine system, we're actually studying uh, hormones and the endocrine glands. And so we term that endocrinology, which is just the study of all these hormones and what they do and what glands they come from and what they control. So it interacts very closely with the nervous system, which as I mentioned is why we're going to include it in the nervous system unit. And the nervous system ultimately does have uh, the majority of control over the endocrine system. But again, they're both um, control systems of the body. Okay, so they control a lot of different uh, internal systems within the body. And all of the organs of the endocrine system are dispersed. So that means they're very separate throughout the body and they are considered ductless glands. So if we remember back when we were talking about the epithelial tissue and exocrine glands, which actually had ducts and they secreted different things from the glands and uh, the secretion would go through a duct to maybe a surface or something. This is a ductless gland, so it's going to produce and secrete these messenger molecules that are called hormones. And they are just going to travel through the bloodstream to whatever effector organ um, they need to go to. So there's no ducts, um, they just have to have a, a vascular supply to get into the blood so those hormones can disperse throughout the body. So if we talk about all the endocrine glands or organs in the body, we actually can break them into three different categories. So we do have some pure endocrine glands, meaning that's all that they're going to do is produce hormones. So that's their whole job. And those guys are really are very important ones that are making the majority of the hormones in the body. But then we do have some organs that contain a large portion of endocrine cells, but they have another function as well. So that's gonna be a, a group as well that we'll talk about. And then we also have some that um, have mostly other jobs, but they do have some endocrine cells. So, you know, these are pretty obvious where when you talk about the heart, digestive tract, kidneys, uh, skin, you know, obviously they have another big job, but they do have some endocrine function. And when we talk about endocrine cells uh, in either these glands or organs, they are all epithelial in origin, just like we were talking about our exocrine glands and the ducts of the exocrine glands. So they are in that epithelial line, okay? So we'll go through all of these um, organs or glands individually, um, starting definitely with these pure endocrine glands, okay? So first, let's talk about what hormones are. So all of these glands are gonna be producing and secreting hormones. And we have two classes of hormones. One is a peptide hormone or protein hormone. So peptide protein means the same thing. It just means that they are amino acid based hormones. Okay, so a lot of our hormones are um, peptide hormones. 
And then we also have quite a few that are steroids, which are derived from cholesterol. So if you can think of them like um, fat-based um, hormones. So we have protein-based hormones and fat-based hormones. And just, you know, to do a little review about how hormones work, I have a very simplistic uh, diagram on the right hand side, but essentially they are going to circulate throughout the body in the blood vessels. And once they reach a target tissue or a target cell, there's going to be a receptor on that cell that's going to bind to the hormone. So that's the whole job. They're going to kind of circulate through the body looking for that receptor on that target cell. And then it's going to influence that cell um, for whatever that uh, control of that hormone does. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how we actually control hormone secretion in the body. That means so we don't have these glands always producing and secreting the hormones at all times. They're going to have to uh, respond in some sort of way. And we have to say we need this hormone or we need to stop making this hormone. So secretion is triggered by one of these three major types of stimuli. And the first type is called humoral, and it's really the simplest of endocrine control because it's directly responding to changing ion or nutrient levels in the blood. So it's keeping track of whatever that chemical may be in the blood. And so say it drops too low, then that's going to trigger secretion of that hormone to increase that ion or whatever that um, chemical may be, and vice versa. If the chemical becomes too high in the blood, then it's going to stop secretion or decrease secretion. So for example, on the right hand side, we're talking about the parathyroid glands. Now the parathyroid glands are going to monitor the calcium levels in the blood directly. And so essentially, if we have a decrease in blood calcium levels, that's going to trigger a secretion from the parathyroid gland to secrete parathyroid hormone, which then increases our blood calcium levels. So again, it's directly um, keeping an eye on the calcium levels or whatever chemical ion or nutrient that is in the blood that that gland is responsible for. Now the second type of control is neural control. So there's going to be a nerve stimulation uh, from the nervous system, obviously, to the gland to cause a release of a hormone. So for example, on our right hand side, we have the sympathetic um, nervous system stimulating the adrenal medulla. So cells in the adrenal medulla to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine. So again, we're going to talk a lot more about the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic uh, system, but essentially the sympathetic is our fight or flight system, right? So it's going to directly respond um, and, and stimulate the adrenal medulla to, to secrete that epinephrine, which is kind of our um, fight or flight hormone, okay? So that's neural control, right? It's in direct uh, control from the nervous system. And our last kind of control, which is uh, a very common type, is the hormonal control. So that means another hormone is actually going to stimulate that gland uh, to release another hormone. So the stimuli is actually just going to come from another hormone, which came from another gland. So you get this kind of hormone um, uh, relay system essentially, right? So for example, on the right hand side, we have our hypothalamus that's going to secrete a hormone, which then stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete more hormones, which then those hormones are going to stimulate other glands to um, secrete a hormone. Okay, so we have kind of this, this hormone secretion relay system, um, kind of a feedback system, okay?
So this is very common uh, in the endocrine system, is this hormonal control. So now let's talk about the feedback system of hormone control. So we know what stimulates these glands to secrete hormones. Either it's going to be some sort of um, humoral response directly monitoring that nutrient or ion, or the nervous system is going to stimulate it, or another hormone is going to stimulate it. But how do we turn it off? right? How do we turn off the system? So there's always going to be this feedback loop, kind of, okay? And so what happens is, is if there's a blood concentration of whatever the substance may be, whether it's a hormone or an ion or a nutrient, if it decreases below a minimum, kind of a set minimum of the body, more hormone is uh, signaled to be secreted. And this is a positive feedback system, right? So we need more hormone because we're lacking uh, in whatever it is responsible for. Now, how do we, so that's kind of how we turn it on. So that's part of that stimulation. But now, say we have too much of the hormone or the nutrient or ion and it exceeds a maximum level, then we're going to have a negative feedback loop where the hormone itself is actually going to tell, or the ion or whatever, is actually going to tell that gland to say, hey, stop production, we have plenty circulating in the blood, we don't need any more. And that's what is showing on the right hand side for um, a negative feedback loop. So very common um, way to control the hormones in our body it is this feedback system. But again, you can see how maybe these loops might um, have some problems as well. So those, these have a lot to do with our disorders in the endocrine system. So now let's go through our individual endocrine organs of the body. And the first one we're going to talk about is the pituitary gland because it's really considered kind of the master gland of the body. It secretes nine major hormones just by itself. So it um, definitely secretes the most hormones out of any gland in the body. And it's attached to the hypothalamus. So remember we talked about the diencephalon with the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And it's actually attached via this uh, structure called the infundibulum. Okay, So it's kind of a stalk coming down or protruding down off the base of the hypothalamus. And the pituitary gland is actually split into two major divisions. And we call it the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. Now they also have other names for them and you may see them uh, or these names in reading or in the textbook or anything like that. So um, the anterior lobe is also called the adenohypophysis and the posterior lobe is the neurohypophysis. So again, if you see those, you, you know that you're talking about the anterior and posterior lobes of the pituitary gland. So the lobes are then further divided into different regions. So if we're talking about the anterior lobe, it has three major regions or divisions, and that's the pars distalis, pars intermedia, and pars tuberalis. Now don't worry as much about the divisions of the lobes, but there are um, some major hormones that come from the different regions. And so there can be uh, disorders and things having to do with the specific divisions or regions, which is why we um, divide it up. But the pars tuberalis is up kind of behind the infundibulum. So it looks like it's coming up and attaching to the hypothalamus, but it's actually not. So in the posterior lobe, we actually have the infundibulum, which is directly attached to the hypothalamus, and the pars nervosa, which is the majority of the posterior lobe, okay? So let's first look at the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, and the pars distalis is the largest region, 
and it's going to actually make uh, and secrete seven different hormones from about five different cells. So a couple of the cells make multiple hormones, but that's not as important, but it's making seven of the nine hormones that the pituitary gland produces or sec and secretes. So we have two types of hormones that the anterior lobe produces, and the first group are called tropic hormones, meaning they're gonna regulate hormone secretion of other glands. So they're gonna do that hormonal control of other glands and their hormone secretion. So we have TSH, ACTH, FSH, and LH. So um, we'll go through these hormones as well and what they do. So don't worry too much yet about them, okay? But that's a, quite a few, so that's four of the seven. And then it also produces some hormones that act directly on the target tissue. And these are non-endocrine tissues. So we have GH, PRL, and MSH, okay? So let's go through those different hormones. So first, let's go through those tropic hormones. So the first one is TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone. So it's gonna stimulate that thyroid gland to secrete thyroid hormone. And so thyroid hormone then works on the body and ultimately controls our metabolic rate. And we don't need to know the, um, the physiology between um, or about thyroid hormone, but just know it has to do with our metabolism. And then we have ACTH. So that's adrenocorticotropic Hormone. So it's a very long name, but if you think of adrenocorticotropic, you can kind of break it down um, and what it does. So it stimulates the adrenal cortex um, to secrete some hormones that cope with stress, such as cortisol. So we'll talk about the adrenal gland in a little bit, um, but that is ACTH, okay? And then our last two, FSH and LH, are actually termed gonadotropins. So these guys are gonna stimulate the gonads, okay? So ovaries and testes. So these guys are follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So they um, essentially stimulate the maturation of sex cells, so eggs in the ovary, sperm in the testes, and they also induce the secretion of the sex hormones from those glands themselves, such as uh, testosterone, androgens, and uh, estrogens, okay? So now we have the last few hormones that are actually going to act directly on the target tissue. So they're not going to stimulate any other hormone secretion. And the first one, arguably a very important hormone, all of these are important, but growth hormone or somatotropic hormone, it's also called, stimulates body growth. Okay, by essentially stimulating protein production and growth of the epiphyseal plates, those growth plates. Our second type is melanocyte stimulating hormone, or MSH, and it's what stimulates the melanocytes to produce melanin, which is our skin pigment that we've been talking about. Um, it also has a function of appetite suppression in humans, and that's there's some research being done there, but again, don't worry too much about that. Uh, think um, melanin and melanocytes. And then our last one in this group is called prolactin or PRL. And this is going to um, target the milk producing glands in the breast tissue to stimulate milk production. So that's prolactin. So it has to do with uh, production of milk, but not uh, milk letdown, which we'll talk about that when we talk about oxytocin, okay? So the anterior pituitary gland is actually under the direct control of the hypothalamus. 
So when you talk about the hypothalamus, it's going to actually have some neurons within the hypothalamus that produce and secrete two different types of hormones that are going to affect the pituitary gland. So we have a group called the releasing hormones, which essentially prompt the, an the anterior lobe to release um, those hormones. Okay, and then we have inhibiting hormones, which actually turn off the secretion um, of the hormones in the anterior lobe. So again, you have releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones. So instead of having kind of a feedback system, you have kind of this direct control <clears throat> from the hypothalamus over the anterior pituitary gland. So now let's talk about how the hypothalamus has control over the anterior pituitary gland. So these hypothalamic hormones, they call them, are actually secreted more like neurotransmitters from these neurons. So which is kind of interesting, right? So they're not really uh, secretory cells in the hypothalamus because it is part of the central nervous system. So they're actually neurons uh, secreting these hormones like neurotransmitters. And what these um, hormones do is they enter what's called the hypophyseal portal system. And this is really an important um, uh, blood system or circulatory system in the uh, pituitary gland. So essentially it's two capillary beds that are connected by veins. So any, any capillary beds that are connected by veins are considered a portal system. So we'll talk about more important portal systems in the body uh, later in the semester, but this is the first one we've seen. And what happens is, is those inhibiting or stimulating hormones that um, are made in the hypothalamus are going to be released in um, this portal system, in this blood supply, okay? And those uh, hormones are then going to be uh, directly connected to the anterior pituitary gland and have direct access through this portal system uh, to then stimulate or inhibit the release of the hormones in the anterior pituitary gland, okay? So then it's right there in the um, uh, circulatory system still, so then those hormones that are actually secreted by the anterior pituitary gland can go right out into circulation and go to the target uh, tissues. So it's just a very quick, um, easy way for the hypothalamus to have control over the anterior pituitary gland through this um, hypophyseal portal system. So this is the image from your book about the hypophyseal portal system, and it's just a step-by-step -step about um, how those hormones are going to stimulate the anterior pituitary gland through this portal system. So it's just showing you kind of a step-by-step -step, um, that we just talked about, but don't worry too much about the details um, of the hypophyseal portal system. Just know uh, what the function of it is. Right, and that's to get those hormones quickly from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland. So now let's talk about the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland because it's completely different from the anterior pituitary gland. So the posterior lobe is actually really part of the hypothalamus. So it is directly and structurally connected uh, to the brain via the infundibulum. And so what happens is, is there's actually neurons that are coming down from the hypothalamus through the infundibulum, and those axons of the neurons are actually creating what is called the hypothalamohypophyseal tract. Now, try to say that five times fast, but essentially you put the two words together, hypothalamo hypophyseal tract, right? So these guys are essentially neuronal cell bodies in the hypothalamus traveling down into the posterior pituitary gland, okay?
So what's really interesting about the posterior lobe and is different from probably just about all the other organs, um, endocrine organs and glands that we'll be talking about is that the posterior lobe does not make its own hormones. So it only stores and releases the hormones that are actually being made up in the hypothalamus, okay? So the hypothalamus is actually making the hormones, right, in the nuclei up, up there. They're going to travel down the infundibulum, down those axon tracks into the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland where they're stored there until they're stimulated to be released into the circulatory system. So there are two peptide hormones that are being stored and released there, and that's the antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. It's also been called vasopressin. I think that's an older term for it. And oxytocin. So antidiuretic hormone think of the word so anti-diuretic so i know a lot of you have probably heard of diuretics right a lot of us drink it in the morning caffeine right and what does caffeine make you do usually makes you have to urinate right so anti-diuretic think the opposite is it's actually going to make the kidneys resorb water so you're not going to urinate and you're going to keep the water in your kidneys in your bloodstream and that's antidiuretic hormone and then oxytocin just like we talked about prolactin uh, inducing milk production oxytocin is going to actually um, uh, release milk from the breast tissue during breastfeeding. It also does a lot of other things. So it does induce some contraction in reproductive organs, um, especially in the uterus during childbirth. So a lot of people term oxytocin kind of the love drug. You know, it helps with the mother um, uh, baby bond as well. So lots of things that the oxytocin does, but milk letdown is a big one as well as smooth muscle contraction of those reproductive organs. So now let's talk about the thyroid gland. So it's located in the anterior neck, so you can actually kind of feel it. It's kind of right above uh, the base of your neck, kind of right below uh, your vocal box or your larynx, right? And it's the largest purely endocrine gland in the body. And it produces two very important hormones. And the first is thyroid hormone. And again, it's under the stimulation of the pituitary gland releasing that thyroid stimulating gland uh, hormone. So when the pituitary gland releases that TSH, it's going to stimulate the thyroid gland to release TH or thyroid hormone. And this affects lots of cells around the body, but just remember that it increases basal metabolic rate. So essentially causes your cells to use oxygen and transform nutrients into energy. So it's gonna increase basal metabolic rate or increase your metabolism. And then the second hormone it produces, a lot of people forget that it produces this hormone because, you know, the thyroid gland, thyroid hormone, that all makes sense. But it also produces calcitonin and calcitonin lowers the blood levels of calcium. This is mostly really active during childhood when your skeleton is growing, right? So you wanna put the calcium from the blood into the bone tissue, the growing bone tissue. So that's calcitonin, which is opposite to that um, parathyroid hormone we just talked about as an example. And we'll talk a little bit more about parathyroid hormone, which is gonna increase your blood calcium levels. So this is just showing you a slide of a cross section of the thyroid gland. And you notice that there's kind of these large circles of uh, pink substance, right? And that's colloid.
So around the colloid, you actually have what are called follicular cells. So these follicular cells are what are responding to that thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland. So it stimulates those follicular cells to secrete thyroid hormone. And so what happens is we have these structures. So all of these circular structures are considered follicles and they're lined by the follicular cells and inside them that pink substance is colloid. And colloid is essentially just the precursor of thyroid hormone. It's a protein called thyroid globulin, okay? And then you might ask, okay, what about calcitonin, right? So you have these cells called these parafollicular cells or next to para, the follicular cells, and they are the ones that are gonna secrete calcitonin. Okay, so they live um, kind of around and in between the follicles. So it's very cool, the thyroid gland under the microscope. And it's very easy to identify because of these bright pink follicles full of colloid. So to go along with the thyroid gland, we have the parathyroid gland. So para, kind of meaning next to, right? These guys are very small glands that actually lie on the posterior surface of the thyroid gland. So there's a, there are those little gold or yellow dots in the picture that are kind of embedded um, in the thyroid tissue. So they're completely segregated or separated from the thyroid tissue itself, but they essentially are associated with the thyroid gland in most people. And it just depends on the person about how many parathyroid glands you have. Um, they have been found in the pharyngeal region as well. So they're not always right embedded in the thyroid gland, but most of the time they are. So we have some um, chief cells. That's the main endocrine cell that produce uh, parathyroid hormone or PTH. So as we said, parathyroid hormone increases our blood concentration of calcium, which is opposite uh, to that calcitonin from the thyroid gland. So now let's talk about the adrenal glands. They're also called suprarenal glands because they sit on top of the kidneys. So we have two adrenal glands, just like we have two kidneys. And they're kind of these little pyramid shaped glands um, and they kind of look like little hats sitting on top of the kidneys. They're kind of cute. And the nerve supply is really almost exclusively the sympathetic system. So again, we'll talk more about the sympathetic system in the next lecture. But essentially, think of the adrenal gland like two endocrine glands in one, okay? It's kind of like the pituitary gland where you have anterior, posterior. In the adrenal gland, we have the adrenal cortex, okay? And the adrenal medulla. So the cortex is kind of the outer portion of the adrenal gland. And the medulla is kind of the central region. So we'll see the terms cortex and medulla again when we talk about the kidneys, when we talk about the ovaries. So it's kind of a general term for the outer region and inner region of an organ. So the adrenal medulla is the one we kind of talked about as an example that is in response to the sympathetic nervous system. So it's what's going to secrete the epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now the adrenal cortex, the outer region, and really the bulk of the gland is gonna respond to the ACTH, that adrenal corticotropic hormone that's going to be um, released from that pituitary gland, okay? But when we're talking about kind of all the hormones that the adrenal gland uh, produces and secretes, they're all gonna help our body cope with kind of danger, um, stress, all of that kind of um, high emotion, high alert type of behaviors. So let's talk about the adrenal cortex first since it's the majority of the gland.
So this is in response to the ACTH, that adrenocorticotropic hormone. So now the name is going to make a little more sense when we talk about the hormones that it secretes. So if the pituitary gland secretes ACTH, it's going to stimulate that adrenal cortex to secrete corticosteroids. So I think a lot of people may have heard of corticosteroids. They're very um, well used in the medical world. And they're really just steroid hormones. They're fat-based, right, our steroid hormone class. And we have two main classes of corticosteroids, and we'll talk about the differences in a minute and what the main uh, hormones are in each class. But we have mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids, but they're all considered corticosteroid. So when you look back at the ACTH, adreno for adrenal gland, and then corticotropic for corticosteroids. Okay, so the name kind of fits, even though it's a very long kind of complex name. ACTH is what we always use, right? So the cortex is actually composed of a couple layers because we have a couple different types of corticosteroids that are being produced. So these different layers are going to produce those different hormones. So if you look at our histological slide on the right hand side, you can see our different layers of the adrenal gland. So on the top is the outer surface of the adrenal gland and that's it has a capsule. And then you have your three layers of the adrenal cortex, which is the zona glomerulosa, which is kind of the outermost layer, the zona fasciculata, which is the largest layer. And you can kind of see the cells are kind of stacked on top of each other, kind of like columns or cords and lots of lipid droplets in there, right? Because all these steroids are lipid based, right? And then the lowest kind of smallest layer of the cortex is the zona reticularis. And they are sitting kind of right next to the adrenal medulla, which is the innermost layer of the adrenal gland. But you can really tell the difference between the cells in that adrenal medulla and in the cortex, right? So a lot more fat droplets within the, um, within the tissue of the cortex. So let's talk about those different corticosteroids. So our main hormone in the mineralocorticoid class is aldosterone. So aldosterone is going to be produced by that top or most superficial layer, the zona glomerulosa. So what does aldosterone do? Well, essentially, it is secreted in a response to kind of a drop in blood pressure or blood volume. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to stimulate the kidneys to resorb more sodium. And what follows sodium or salt? That's water. Okay, so it's going to do a very simul similar thing to um, our antidiuretic hormone or ADH from the posterior pituitary gland. So it's going to increase blood volume. It's going to hold on to water. So essentially it's going to tell the kidneys to absorb more water, but through a different system than our ADH. So the ADH tells it to directly resorb more water, whereas aldosterone is going to say resorb more salt or sodium, and therefore the water has to follow the salt. Okay, so similar response, but different mechanism, okay, of action for the hormone. Now, our other class of corticosteroid is the glucocorticoids. And so most people probably know this class um, a little bit better because the main hormone in this class is cortisol. Okay, so cortisol is secreted by the other two layers, the zona fasciculata and zona reticularis. So what does cortisol do? Think about stressful situations. That's gonna help our body deal with stress. So one, it's going to increase blood sugar, okay, because what does, what organ really needs sugar? 
that's our brain. So essentially it's gonna keep a higher level of sugar in the blood to supply our brain function. Okay, that sounds like a good deal, right? It inhibits the immune system. So large quantities of cortisol actually depresses the inflammatory response and inhibits the immune system. Now you may think, okay, well, that doesn't sound very good. But if you're under a stressful situation, you don't want to be dealing with inflammation, right? You wanna put your energy sources towards something else, okay? Like combat or whatever that stressful situation may be. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you've ever experienced, you know, some high stress in your life, and after that stressful event goes away, what happens? You get sick almost automatically, right? You come down with that cold. Now, that's because you have depressed that immune system for a little while. And now it's like, oh, crap, we got to deal with whatever you were exposed to. So that's why cortisol can be detrimental to your body, okay, if you're always under constant stress. But another thing is, is it is a very strong anti-inflammatory, you know, which is also very good in certain situations. So it is actually used in a lot of medications, right, such as prednisone, cortisone, pretty much anything that says zone, is um, a cortisol-based um, medication, okay? So it's a very strong anti-inflammatory, which can be very helpful in certain situations, but definitely not long-term, right? So short-term increase in blood sugar, decrease immune system seems okay, but not long-term. So now let's talk about the inside of the adrenal gland, and that's the adrenal medulla. So these cells that are in the medulla are actually modified sympathetic neurons. So they're really part of the nervous system, if you think of it that way. And they're called medullary chromaffin cells, but don't worry too much about what they're called. Just know that they are really these modified sympathetic neurons. And they're going to secrete those peptide or protein hormones, norepinephrine and epinephrine. And these guys are really our fight or flight hormones. They enhance the fight or flight response. So they're going to be in response to an extremely um, uh, stressful situation, right? <clears throat> now these hormones are stored in secretory vesicles and then they are uh, secreted really straight into the bloodstream in the adrenal medulla. And we already looked at the um, histological slide to kind of show you the difference between um, the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex cells. So this is just showing that slide again, that histological slide, showing you the different layers of the cortex and the medulla and the different hormones that are secreted there. So if you look at the cortex, you've got your mineralocorticoids, which is mostly aldosterone up at the top. And then you've got your glucocorticoids, which are mostly cortisol, but you've also got some androgens in there as well in those other two layers. And then you have your epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are our peptide hormones uh, produced in that adrenal medulla, okay? So now let's cover our little pineal gland. So it's actually kind of pine cone shaped, which is where the name, the term comes from where we call it the pineal gland. And it's really located um, near the thalamus, um, not really near the hypothalamus, but it's all part of the diencephalon, right? So we have the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and the epithalamus. So it's really the majority of the epithalamus. And we have these cells called pineolocytes. And don't worry too much about how they're arranged, but they're kind of in these clusters and cords. And they secrete melatonin. So melatonin is really important for our circadian rhythms. So it kind of tells us when to go to sleep, right? And when to wake up 
And so that's your circadian rhythm, which is really in response to UV light, okay? So it responds to UV light, but um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever taken melatonin when you have a hard time sleeping. It really helps um, with people that have a hard time falling asleep, as well as when you go through time change, right? So if you go to a different part of the world and you're undergoing um, a time change, it can really help you adapt a little bit quicker to that new time zone because your body's not used to it and you're, it takes a little more time for your body to naturally produce that melatonin. So if you take it, it can help you adapt a little bit quicker. So we've gotten through all of our um, organs and glands that are just purely endocrine um, function. And now we're going to talk about some organs that have um, a lot of endocrine function, but they may have some other function as well. And our first organ is the pancreas. And this is really in the posterior, kind of superior posterior abdominal location. And it contains both endocrine and exocrine cells. So the exocrine cells we'll talk a little bit more about when we talk about the digestive system because they secrete the, uh, the majority of our digestive enzymes, okay? And those are the acinar cells. But what we're concerned about for this um, unit are the endocrine cells or the pancreatic islets. And so if you look on the right hand side, we have our histological slide showing some pancreatic tissue. And we notice that there's a distinct circle with some different looking kind of puffier cells in the center. And then around the outside, there's bright pink cells, right? So those are our two different cell types. The cell types around the outside that are bright pink are the acinar cells, those exocrine cells. And then within that circle, those kind of lighter pink cells, little fluffier cells, are the pancreatic islet cells. And we have two different types of cells in there. And you're not going to be able to say this cell is an alpha cell, this cell is a beta cell. Maybe if you, you know, looked at slides all the time, you'd be able to tell, but I'm not going to ask you the difference. They're just the alpha cells are slightly brighter pink, right? And beta cells are a little lighter pink. That's all I can tell the difference. But essentially, we're what we're worried about is the hormones that these two types of cells produce. So let's look at these two endocrine cells in the pancreas. So the alpha cells are going to secrete glucagon and beta cells are going to secrete insulin. So probably the majority of us have heard of insulin. We may or may not know exactly what it does, but maybe we know it has something to do with blood sugar. So both of these hormones have to do with blood sugar. So glucagon, okay, is going to signal the liver to release glucose from glycogen. And glycogen is our storage of glucose in the liver. And so what happens is it actually raises our blood sugar. Okay, so say our blood sugar is a little low, we haven't had a meal in a while, and <clears throat> we need the glucose in our blood, right? It's very important for our metabolic purposes in our brain. So it's gonna uh, signal that liver to release some um, from glycogen, okay? So that storage of glucose in our liver and that raises our blood sugar, okay? Now, opposite to that is insulin, okay? So insulin signals the body cells to take up glucose from our blood and it promotes the storage of glucose as glycogen in the liver. So it tells the cells to use the glucose and tells the liver to store it, okay? So therefore, it lowers the sugar in the blood, lowers, lowers our blood sugar, okay? So that's the difference uh, between glucagon and insulin. One raises our blood sugar, the other one decreases our blood sugar. And we'll talk a little bit more about diabetes and insulin um, in a minute because that's one of our disorders, right? 
That's probably why a lot of us have heard of it. So the thymus gland is one that we kind of get confused with the thyroid gland. So thyroid and thymus, they live somewhat close to each other. The thyroid is kind of up in the neck and the thymus kind of lives um, right on top of your heart, essentially in that mediastinal region. And so this is a very important organ to the immune system. So not only does it have some uh, endocrine function, it really has a lot of immune function. So what happens in the thymus is we actually mature our T lymphocytes in the thymus. So we'll talk all about the immune system and lymphocytes in another lecture, but essentially it's where our um, immune cells, these lymphocytes, learn what is self and what is not self, because we don't really want our immune cells attacking our own body. So these lymphocytes have to go essentially to immune school and they go to the thymus to learn and mature. So the thymic hormones are helping to stimulate that maturation process of our lymphocytes, okay? And you don't need to know the different thymic hormones, just know that the thymus has to do with the immune system and that maturation of lymphocytes. So now let's talk about the gonads. These are also organs that have um, not only endocrine function, but other functions as well. So they're really the main source of our sex hormones. So the testes are the gonads in the male and the ovaries are the gonads in the female. So these guys are responding to LH and FSH, which we said are the gonadotropic hormones produced in the anterior pituitary gland. So what do they do? So in the male, the LH or luteinizing hormone is gonna stimulate some interstitial cells within the testes to secrete androgens, primarily testosterone when you think of androgens, but there is some estrogen in there as well. So a lot of people forget that estrogen is an androgen. And then FSH or follicle stimulating hormone is going to promote the formation and maturation of sperm in the testes. And then in the female, we have the same luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So the LH is going to stimulate our follicles in the ovaries to secrete androgens. Okay, so again, we've got estrogen and progesterone. And don't worry too much about the details of those hormones. Okay, we're not going to uh, cover that, but just no androgens, right? And then our follicle stimulating hormone is named perfectly because it promotes follicular growth um, in the ovaries, which is the egg development, right? The follicle development, okay? So now we've gotten to our third category of endocrine structures where the organ usually has um, a much bigger job, but it may have a few endocrine cells that have a little bit of endocrine function. So things you may not even think of that have endocrine function, such as the heart. So the heart is obviously controlling our um, uh, blood pumping around our body through our vessels, but within the atria, there's actually a hormone that lowers blood pressure. Okay, so it's going to combat um, those other two hormones in the body, ADH and aldosterone, that's going to increase our blood pressure. So we have a lot more things in our body that's going to want to increase blood pressure, because if you think about it, to um, live and succeed in life and run away from predators is uh, increasing your blood pressure. Right, so that is definitely a more defensive system is increasing your blood pressure. But that's also why many of us um, in the world have problems with high blood pressure. But anyways, I digress. Uh, the gastrointestinal tract, so our GI tract, actually has cells that secrete gastrin, which stimulates our acid release in our stomach. So it's how we help um, break down food in our stomach. 
Okay, so that kind of makes sense. And we'll talk all about that uh, in the GI track uh, lecture, right? In the placenta, right? So the developing fetus um, is actually sustained with steroid hormones that are uh, produced by the placenta itself. So the placenta can produce these steroid hormones um, that says, hey, we're pregnant, we need to keep the pregnancy around. So it tells the body uh, to maintain uh, the pregnancy. And then in our kidneys, so we have a lot of hormones that act on the kidney tissue, but within the kidneys itself, it actually secretes a hormone to increase blood pressure as well. So um, another way to increase our blood pressure, as well as make red blood cells. So we'll talk a little bit more about that specific hormone, erythropoietin, when we talk about the urinary tract, okay? And last but not least, our skin. So a lot of us have kind of talked about vitamin D and the integumentary system in our discussion. So the skin does have a hormone precursor uh, that our skin turns into vitamin D. So that is a hormone um, that we're producing into vitamin D. Okay, because vitamin D is one of our steroid uh, vitamins, so our fat vitamins, right? So that makes sense that it comes from a steroid hormone, okay? So all these things have a little bit of endocrine function, but it's not their main purpose, right? So now let's get into some cool disorders of the endocrine system. So the endocrine system tends to have quite a few disorders, um, but they can be quite interesting and some of them are a little more rare and some are a little more common. So first we're gonna talk about the pituitary disorders. Okay, so this has to do specifically with the hormones um, secreted by the pituitary gland. So the first two, gigantism and dwarfism, have to do with growth hormone, okay? And these are specific, again, to the pituitary gland. We can have other causes of, especially dwarfism. There's a couple causes of dwarfism, um, but this is the pituitary dwarfism. So if you have too much growth hormone or hypersecretion, you get gigantism, and if you have to little growth hormone or hyposecretion, you get dwarfism, okay? Now, this last disorder of the pituitary gland is gonna maybe throw a few of you guys off because it's termed diabetes insipidus. So it's not the diabetes that all of us are very familiar with that has to do with insulin. We'll talk about that in a minute. This one has to do with the antidiuretic hormone, okay? So diabetes insipidus has to do with the posterior pituitary gland uh, not <clears throat> releasing enough antidiuretic hormone. So the kidneys don't take en up enough water, so they're gonna increase urination, so you get this kind of dilute watery urine, and you get concentrated blood because we don't have enough uh, water in our blood. It gets kind of sludgy. So that's diabetes insipidus. So now let's talk about the disorders of the pancreas. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the diabetes we're familiar with, and that's diabetes mellitus. So I want you guys to be aware that there are two diabetes, and I want you to know the differences, right? So diabetes insipidus in the posterior pituitary gland, diabetes mellitus in the pancreas. So we have two types of diabetes mellitus as well. Most of us are probably familiar with the type 2, which is also termed adult onset diabetes. <clears throat> but there is a type 1 diabetes as well, which is usually found in younger people because it has to do with an autoimmune disease where you actually destroy your own beta cells in the pancreas. So if you destroy those beta cells, they can't produce insulin. So type 1 diabetics cannot produce 
insulin. So they are very dependent upon uh, insulin. Okay. Now that's different from type 2 because in type 2, the cells of our body have a lower sensitivity to insulin. That means when the body sees insulin, the cells don't take up glucose from the, sh from the blood. Okay, so there's essentially a resistance to insulin. So we, as our body, can produce insulin, but the cells in our body doesn't listen to it. Okay, so we develop an insulin resistance. And that's type 2 diabetes. Okay, so therefore, that can be a little more complex because even if you pump yourself more with more insulin, the cells may not respond, right? So usually you have to have high levels of insulin to get your body to respond to it, okay? So that's why there's a lot of other treatments for type 2 diabetes to try to get your cells to be more responsive to insulin, not necessarily just throwing more insulin in your body. So now let's talk about some disorders of the thyroid gland and the adrenal gland, specifically the adrenal cortex. So first, let's remind ourselves what the thyroid gland does. So we're really just going to be talking about the thyroid hormone in this case, which increases our basal metabolic rate or our metabolism. So if you've noticed with all of these disorders, usually we have a problem with too much of the hormone or too little of the hormone. So in this case, we have hyperthyroidism, which is also called Graves disease, which is a, the most common type of hyperthyroidism in humans. And so you have too much thyroid hormone, right? So what happens is you're gonna increase your metabolism kind of beyond normal, right? <clears throat> so you get nervousness, sweating, rapid heart rate, right? So that is hyperthyroidism. <clears throat> and then conversely, you have hypothyroidism, which is a lot more common actually, especially in um, older women, we see hypothyroidism a lot. And a type of that is myxedema is another term for hypothyroidism. So you have decreased thyroid hormones. So you're going to decrease that metabolic rate. So you might get weight gain, right, as a very common symptom of hypothyroidism. And now let's talk about the adrenal cortex, okay? So if we remind ourselves, what does the adrenal cortex produce? It produces corticosteroids, right? Specifically, we talked about cortisol, which is our glucocorticoid, and aldosterone, which is our mineralocorticoid. So again, we're gonna have some disorders regarding those hormones. So Cushing's disease, or Cushing's syndrome, we call it, is a hypersecretion of our cortisol. Okay, so too much cortisol. So this is a stress hormone. So we said increase blood sugar, right? So high blood sugar, um, you're really going to depress the immune system and the inflammatory response. So you're going to be very, um, very suspect to infection, right? Because you're depressing that immune system. Also a swollen face, so you get some edema. Now Cushing's syndrome is also seen in a lot of animals. So dogs can get Cushing's, horses can get Cushing's. They might be a slightly different process, but the overall uh, result is usually the same, okay? So that's Cushing's, which is actually, I'd say, more common in animals than it is in humans. And then we have Addison's disease, okay, which is somewhat common, and it's a severe hyposecretion of aldosterone, okay? So you have a very low level of aldosterone. So if we remind ourselves what aldosterone does is it talks to the kidneys. It's kind of similar to antidiuretic hormone, but it tells the kidneys to take up 
um, salt, right, sodium. So then the water will follow. So we're supposed to increase our blood volume, our blood pressure. So you get a severe uh, sodium drop, severe drop in blood pressure, um, severe dehydration, right? So you're not getting hydrated because you're losing all that water in your kidneys. So you get a lot of fatigue as well. So Addison's disease is hypoaldosterone, low aldosterone, but severely low, okay? So this is just a cartoon image of some of these um, different disorders. Again, you don't need to know all of the details, but I think it may help you to kind of, you know, put some pictures to the names, okay? Now let's talk a little bit about the development or the embryological development of some of these endocrine glands. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about the glands that have these dual origins because they have uh, the two different portions of the gland that do such different functions, which is kind of an interesting idea. And the embryological development explains their different functions. So, in the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary gland, which secretes um, the majority of those hormones, are going to, or it is going to originate from the roof of the mouth, okay? So from tissue, so epithelial tissue coming up from the roof of the mouth. Whereas the posterior pituitary gland actually grows downward or inferiorly from the floor of the brain. Right? So that's why it's nervous tissue versus our anterior pituitary gland, which is epithelial tissue. Okay? So difference in origin there, as well as the adrenal gland, right? So we have the, the adrenal cortex, which um, has our corticosteroids, right? Steroid hormones. And then the adrenal medulla, which is um, again nervous tissue right, with those sympathetic um, neuron-like cells, okay? So the adrenal cortex actually comes from the lining of the coelom, and the coelom essentially is kind of the um, fetal intestines or fetal stomach, abdomen, right? So it's kind of coming from the mesoderm, which is that middle layer, which is kind of connective tissue, um, things like that, right? Whereas the adrenal medulla is coming from these neural crest cells, which we talked about the neural crest cells when we were talking about the development of the spinal cord, right? From a nearby sympathetic trunk ganglia. So we'll talk about the sympathetic trunk ganglia um, in our autonomic nervous system lecture next, um, next time. But essentially think, right, neural crest, neural tube, nervous tissue, right? So that's kind of interesting where we get these dual origins of these glands where they have two different portions that do completely different things. So this is just showing you the development of the pituitary gland. And it's just kind of interesting, but you don't need to know all of the names or anything like that of like the, the developmental names, right? But it just kind of shows you uh, the different tissue type, right? So the dark blue is the neural tissue, whereas the light blue is more the um, ectoderm um, or epithelial tissue arising from the roof of the mouth, which is really kind of interesting, okay? So just kind of cool and an interesting way to think about how the body develops these different organs and glands. So if we look at the endocrine system throughout life, really our organs pretty much operate fairly effectively um, throughout our life into old age, um, except for some expected uh, declines in some of our hormones.
So the anterior pituitary gland fares okay, but we do have some decreased vascularization. So you kind of have a decrease of some of the hormone secreting cells because you don't get as much blood supply. Um, but the thyroid hormone we said can, um, we do see hypothyroidism uh, fairly common in older women. So that um, has uh, been a trend. But the really predictable ones are the sex hormones and growth hormone, right? So obviously growth hormone has a marked drop in age. And then also um, sex hormones specifically in uh, women, but also in men, uh, even though I don't have a graph for males and testosterone, but um, it's similar, just not quite as dramatic um, as the female. So our top graph is just showing the decrease in estrogen and progesterone as we age, and we have a specific name for that um, time in women's lives, right? And that's menopause, because they have this very, um, uh, very dramatic drop in the, um, the two uh, sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. But um, really a big problem is the progesterone, specifically because you see a more significant drop in progesterone. And so there's a, a bigger contrast uh, between the two, which can cause um, a lot of the symptoms of menopause. So again, you don't need to know all the details of menopause and all of this, but um, just kind of to give you an idea. And then obviously the second graph has to do with hormone uh, growth hormone. So, you know, it's very high when we're young and growing and then it's going to slowly taper off um, as we age, right? So here are our learning objectives for this lecture. So really pay attention, maybe make some flashcards, right? For all these glands and all these hormones. Um, so go through this, make sure you kind of understand um, what you need to know from this lecture. So next time we're going to finish off our nervous system unit with the autonomic nervous system. I know we skipped that chapter, so we're going to come back to it and talk about the sympathetic and parasympathetic um, nervous system. And then here are some study questions if you want to do some more practice from your textbook. All right, everyone stay awesome and I will see you guys next time.